Right, so welcome everyone to Psychology on Demand. Today I have an author, a lecturer, um, and, uh, and a therapist, uh, uh, Tobin Bao. So welcome to the channel. Um, <laughs> Thanks, James. Hello. Hi, <laughs> nice to have you on. Um, so, so today I really wanted to say a little bit more about your kind of journey. Um, I guess for me, you were a big part of my journey. Um, so uh, on my route, uh, compassionate uh, fo kind of CFT, compassionate focus therapy came in um, on one of my very first trainings in imagery with, with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember a big tussle with this idea that the inner critic wasn't helping me. Uh, and I remember being like, oh, is that, I can't be, I've been using this thing. Uh, and so today I really want to understand a bit more about your journey. Um, and hopefully I can ask you a bit more as we go through. <clears throat> Sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think, I mean, so it's my journey to where I am at the moment was originally in terms of psychotherapy via CBT and, you know, and I still practice CBT. So it's, you know, it's great in all sorts of ways and found it really helpful personally and professionally. But I suppose it became the clients where they were facing such big life experiences or such strong patterns where actually it was very difficult to change um, or get sort of flexibility around um, kind of experiences they had and the thoughts they had. And it kind of led me towards more acceptance-based methods, mindfulness, um, and trained trained in that. Um, and I think sort of personally it's the same, like the CBT was really helpful, but there's so much that didn't shift and didn't change. And so on a personal level, I thought, well, how, how am I going to how am I going to live with this stuff? Um, and, and I think it moved to more, yeah, more acceptance based approaches. And then I think it was on a mindfulness retreat where I think halfway through it was a silent retreat, and then just somebody just dropped in their compassion meditation, and it just like transformed everything. It just changed the way I held experiences, the way I thought about them, the way I felt towards myself, um, future. And so that kind of led path of being more and more interested in CFT and studying it and researching it and uh, and becoming a trainer in it, et cetera. Um, so I think that's kind of my route. And so it feels like the personal and professional sort of overlapped in some way. Um, and it's you know, it remains my go-to orientation, really, CFT. Yeah. I think it, uh, trying to thought challenge a inner critic is yeah uh, yeah that's i think for myself as well that was a bit where actually it felt like something you needed something um yeah i think so and i think it's it's sort of those experiences patterns of experience of shame and self-criticism that don't seem to give so easy to that um you know to to a cbt approach and as you know there's evidence that it does you know people don't recover in the same ways when they have those experiences so i think yeah absolutely i think it's it's also about building things as well I think so that sense of cultivating building something alongside those experiences strengthening other patterns parts voices mindsets what have you that that seemed to be really powerful and then practicing and potentiating those parts of the self uh, instead and putting your energy in that direction and I mean I had a, I had a really bad self-critic uh, kind of growing up caused all sorts of problems but I remember I can even remember the place where it was where you know, after doing this CFT practices and thinking oh it's kind of good and it's nice and it's helpful and then suddenly it just sort of showed up um, walking down a corridor at the hallway and at home and after a tricky day clinically and just showed up and it sort of reassured me it sounded like uh, how my dad sort of speaks to me when he's um, you know very close and yeah, just so surprised that that resource could be sort of part of my day-to-day -day experience, really. So quite quite an important kind of self-discovery as well as teaching others and uh, helping others with that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think that's the thing with CFT. It's it's a human model of distress. It's not a model of disorder. So I think there is the invitation and almost the obligation to do some work on yourself and I think from practicing and training in it it's the self-practice that really leads to the insights and the confidence um to do this stuff but also 
the kind of empathy for actually how hard how hard this stuff is. Because like, you know, we kind of we kind of know lots of us that this stuff's good. We'd intuitively give it to others, but actually folding it back to us and opening to it from others is really really difficult for all sorts of good reasons. And that then becomes the interesting edge um, to work with. So that kind of self reflection and and developing as a practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I was interested there, you were saying a little bit about kind of childhood popping up. Yeah. Um, and one of the biggest things that I'm really interested in where all the origins come from and things like that. Um, but I was curious for, for yourself along your journey and, and, and in research and things like that, where do you feel that the inner critic kind of, where are kind of the most important points in life where that comes from where, where would you say is the is the origin of of the inner critic yeah. i mean i think there's lots of evidence that suggests that various childhood experiences do influence um self-criticism i mean i think just on a on just a fundamental level external relationships influence internal relationships and in cfd we're always thinking dialogically about relationships between self and self um, as well as kind of self to others and backwards and forwards. Um, yeah, so I suppose uh, I suppose from a CFT perspective, we understand it in terms of social mentality theory. So it's the kind of idea we have particular, we develop particular modes of mind um, and mindsets to be able to facilitate um, kind of particularly like goal-based behavior so it'd be like evolve goals for forming cooperative relationships for forming sexual relationships for forming care-based relationships etc and it's the idea that we um we have very different mindsets that facilitate that social exchange that giving and receiving of social signals um and i suppose it's kind of what social mentalities are potentiated in people when they're growing up so you know if you have a secure um kind of attachment relationships and support, then you're more likely to develop um, sort of internalized care base kind of relationships. So the, the way I guess that others relate to the self then gets replayed internally in terms of the way you relate to um, difficult experiences. So there's a part that shows up and gives care and then the part that um, is distressed and receives the care. If you've, if you've gone through a very difficult um, experiences where um, you're competing for resources and attention and there's neglect or absence or abuse then it's the idea it sort of potentiates that competitive rank-based internal relationship where there's a part that is abusive or hostile and then the part that that receives it and submits um, in some way so i suppose it's the type of relationships that occur outside that then get replayed inside um, so paul's idea is that you develop these mentalities to navigate um, external social relationships, but because of the way the mind's evolved and the fact that we can have relationships with ourselves, um, that those same mentalities show up in terms of self-to-self -self relationships. And and basically, on a on a on a fundamental level, CFT is about shifting internal and external relationships from competitive ones where there is dominance and subordination and and flipping backwards and forwards to care-based relationships where you kind of receive care from outside you give care from inside you receive care from inside etc cetera, etc cetera. So it's, um, kind of, it's kind of mimicking our relationships it's and 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 our how how we're treated when we're in a vulnerable state is how we might treat our own vulnerable state yeah it? yeah absolutely and it's I suppose lots of therapies have different ways of formulating it as um, punitive parents are internalised as the critic or in, interjects objects, etc. But it's it's the same kind of theory, really. Um, and I suppose then it has what we're interested in see if the is the the function of the critic, what kind of function it serves. And I suppose the reason why we might play out these internal battles rather than dealing with them externally is because often the the person outside is very powerful and we still need to be um you know part of the family part of the group so so we you know we're willing to take on almost this scrutinizing monitoring critical internal object um 
as a way to kind of defend ourselves against um, powerful external objects. So it kind of almost shows that how important um, external social connection is that we'd be willing to play out quite brutal um, internal relationships as a way to keep maintaining external relationships. So to keep proximity with these parental figures, we might keep this this internal battle going. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it serves all sorts of functions. It could serve the function of, um, you know, kind of motivating us to do particular things, to achieve things. But then, you know, if you if you do kind of explore that and do some uh, reflection with clients, it often comes back to, you know, why is it important that you have to achieve? Why is the critic so concerned about you achieving and uh, improving? Well, you know, it's because actually I had to impress people. I had to achieve things. If I didn't, then I felt like I was lesser than. And, you know, underneath it, they're pretty core common themes of rejection, harm, and sort of failure in a way. Um, and I think they they all originate in the social realm, really. And, and I think when, when you did your imagery talk as well, there was quite a few other people. It wasn't just me that was kind of tussling this idea that we didn't need this inner critic to kind of push yeah. us, uh, that it wasn't helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's it's kind of an interesting edge, isn't it, really? Because we, we would understand the critic is coming from the threat protection system. Mm. And it is trying to protect us in some way. That's where its kind of origin is, really. It's kind of shown up because there's been scary external things happening. Um, so kind of it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think that's what the interesting thing about CFT is, is it tries to work with the critic in a compassionate way. So... You know, usually the first stage of the exercises are to show the, the power and impact of the critic. And in that stage, you really do sort of have to show how how defeating, how dominant, how, how toxic it can become. But you can also bring the compassionate self to the critic and understand, well, I can see what you're trying to do. I see that, you know, underneath this, you're terrified that, I don't know, James is going to make a mistake. James is going to be caught out. He's going to be seen... Uh, he's, the the imposter's going to be found out. So I get why you keep coming up. And, you know, it's okay as a compassionate self. I'm going to help James. I'm going to support him doing dot, dot, dot. So I suppose the, the compassionate self needs to meet some of the functions of the critic to really be used. Um, so, you know, it might be protection, encouragement. So I think it's a really good tip. The compassionate self's not just there to to soothe things and make things kind of easy. It's got to be able to help the person in the way they want, like encouragement, discernment in terms of who to trust and who not to trust, protection, et cetera. So, so it's almost taking over the role of the function, the function of the inner critic and why we're using it. The compassionate one's coming in and saying, I, I see why you're doing that, but let's do it in a different way. Is that kind of, am I understanding yeah, that? Yeah, that's it. And, and often the, the way we illustrate that particular point would be about having um, a child going to a teacher and you know say you you went to a school and you saw a teacher really uh, like abusing a child for a mistake and like calling up all their past errors and um, kind of threatening them if they don't improve um, you know they're going to be excluded sent to the corner and they get humiliated then you go to a, another school and you see the same mistake but a teacher um, so sort of coming down to eye level, encouraging, supporting, really wanting the child to succeed, but finding ways to encourage them, makes them feel safe enough to try again, um, to remember the mistakes they might have made as a way to improve, but maybe it's kind of more forward looking and maybe um, mindful of the child's emotions. So, you, you know, the question then is, so, you know, which one would you send your child or a loved one to? And well, most people say, or the second one, of course, and then the question is, well, why do you send yourself repeatedly to the first? Um, and I suppose it's it's that bit, it just doesn't serve the function it's kind of developed to do in a way. I, I think that'd be really helpful for kind of viewers as well. And, and for me in my practice, the idea of showing showing those those two um, and, and coming up with unique ways to kind of give perspective. Um, yeah. And the the you know, the common way to do it in CFT is via chair work as well. So you'd you'd have say you know you've got a chair there next to you, so it'd be 
um, you know, James, could you could you show me rather than tell me about this stuff? Can you get the critic out of your head and show me like how the critic speaks to sp- speaks really to you when when you are we made an error or feel disappointed, and then swap over and receive it. So you know, rather than talking about this stuff and saying actually this critic is beating you down and it's not particularly helpful, you know, you demonstrate it, um, and then you can bring in another chair and say, well, let's try. A different way of coaching this part working with the same disappointment let's do it from the compassion itself so you've got the kind of direct comparison really between them both excellent well if you feel comfortable we could maybe give it a go with the chairs and uh yeah yeah if that uh, you're That's gonna fun. have to guide me a bit here uh, so yeah. I, I haven't i'm not actually trained in chair work i'm i'm, I'm next on that's my next uh, training your uh, chair work uh, <laughs> um course but if you could guide me through how to maybe if, uh, I don't know if you want me to come up with an example if you've got one and, and maybe we can yeah I mean there's there's lots of there's lots of ways you can do this and chair works amazing in terms of external so I think there's loads of processes going on in chair work mm-hmm. so chair work I suppose is just a collection of experiential exercises that use chairs their positioning and movement between them mm-hmm. um, and it's drawn from all sorts of therapies but originated in psychodrama and the first part of chair work is to to think about um, self-multiplicity and then to separate. So it's kind of thinking about, well, what parts are we working with and trying to listen in stereo rather than mono so we can think, right, if you were to say something like, I'm stupid, oh, listen, to this thing, it's really stupid, I'm really stupid. We would say, okay, well, it sounds like there's a part that says, like, you're stupid. And then there's a part that then receives that and says, yeah, yeah, I am. So there's a part that's attacking and a part that's kind of vulnerable and receiving. Um, and then you bring it to life. So that's the next bit. You kind of start the information exchange. You bring it to life. And you can do that via personification, which might be, I'd say, James, looking at that chain. Can you see the critic, what it looks like, and mm-hmm. its facial expressions and its gestures and how tall it would be and all that thing? Um, so that's one way. And you could talk to it. Uh, and then another way you could do embodiment, where you'd then go over and be the critic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you'd, you'd kind of act as it, speak as it, and dialogue as it. Um, and really the idea in chair work is then the transformatory um, piece is, or process, is the dialogical exchange. So exchanging information between parts um, so that, I don't know, all sorts of things can occur. Negotiation, assimilation, boosting one, reducing another. Depends what modality you're using, but you know, that's kind of how we make sense of it, really. So one some of the chair work exercises are a bit longer, but I wonder if we could do one that's more like um, an interviewing style that's drawn from voice dialogue, if you're interested. Yeah, so, it'd be, um, so I don't know, James, if you do have uh, a recent example of self-criticism that we could use. Um, yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, basically, I, I had a go at a project that uh, it, um in, in my bathroom and yeah. it went it didn't go well okay <laughs> um so a little bit it, i wasn't kind of it, it's i had a little bit of a go at myself for, for for trying it um so i think that might be a nice example it's not too heavy but it's a little heavy. bit of it is that okay yeah, of course it is and if it, if it gets too heavy just to stop oh no it's, okay. it's it's manageable so. <laughs> So what you know, there's what we could do. We could there's one say the typical one might be you know you'd you'd attack James in one chair um, for kind of messing up. You'd swap over and and then kind of feel that um, kind of feel that kind of impact, and then we might kind of step to compassion itself. And often what's helpful before doing an exercise like this is to ask like a question around self criticism. So for example, um, I could ask you know if if I had a magic red button trained in CFT, I'm like a kind of ninja in it now. I've got this button you press and like the, the critic disappears forever. Would you press it? Would I press it? Mm. I, if you'd asked me this in 2018, I wouldn't have, but now, yeah, no, now I would. Yeah. Uh, if, if I could, if I could soothe that, yeah. Yeah. So usually the, the answer for most people is no or kind of conditionally no. Um, and if you're doing that kind of exercise, it's a good setup to frame it positively and then to check to see if it is having that function. Most people would say, well, actually, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't press the button because I'd be worried that my motivation would kind of fall apart or I wouldn't care anymore or um, you know, 
or I'd kind of be revealed as like a Trumpian big head or whatever, a narcissist. Um, so there's lots of fears, and then you, you'd kind of demonstrate, you do like an experiment, well, let's see if the critic does do that. You know, if it, if it is helping you reflect, is it, if, if it is helping you to motivate and do, you know, try again on the tiling or whatever it is. So that's one way, but I'm going to show like a slightly different way okay. where we get to the function in, in a slightly different way. So so, I'd, so what I'm going to suggest, James, then, is to, to make a movement in a minute um, it could be backwards or forwards, side to side, and I'm going to ask you when you take up the new position to be the inner critic. And okay. all I'm going to do as the therapist is just going to ask a couple of questions just to get to know it. Because okay. it sounds like the critic <clears throat> was quite strong uh, in the bathroom, and uh, I don't know James very well, but like any other human being, critics kind of show up quite a lot, and they often have things to say, things they're concerned about, so it's just a chance to get to know it. Okay. Um, so should I jump chair? Yeah. Then? yeah I... So you can move, move chairs. Here. You can yeah, move yeah. position of the same chair wherever it feels like the critic yeah. might reside in the room. Okay. Yeah. He's here. Okay. okay. And in this role, you see if you can stay as the critic, and I'll just okay. ask you some questions in role. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you're the part of James that criticizes him. Yep. And you're the part of James that. Um, Sounds like he's concerned about him making mistakes and errors. And you don't have to talk to the other chairs, just talking to me and I just oh, okay. ask you some questions. Yeah. Um so I could wonder, could you could you just tell me what, what you criticize in James? Uh that he that he even tried. That why did I, he try? Okay. So you're you think he you think he shouldn't have tried? No, shouldn't have tried. He's, he's okay, silly for even trying it. No. Yeah, why why is it why is it silly for him to try something like the bathroom thing? Because he should have known that he should have known that he he wasn't going to get it done. Okay, so you kind of you think he should be more aware of what could go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and you'd be pointing out. I mean, what would you point out then? What have you been pointing out to him that's kind of um, gone wrong? That that he's not on it enough. That he needs to be. That he yeah needs to be more. He needs to know more. He needs to know what okay. he can and can't do and, do and do the things he can and not. Right. So you're kind of there, it sounds like, to kind of prompt him to, to kind of be on the ball more, be more aware of these things that could go wrong. Yeah. 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 And are you there just for the bathroom or you, do you kind of show up at other times as well? Oh, I, yeah. I show up a fair few times. Yeah. 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 Can you give me any, any other examples? Where else you show up for him? Oh, um... Does he show up? Uh, Do you show up at all with his um, work? Oh, um, hmm, when do I show up? It's normally where I go wrong. If I make a mistake, if if it's mm. quite a, a biggish mistake, or I feel that w where where he's it's big, it's something he should have okay. seen. Something he yeah. should, definitely should have seen. Um, so that links back to you. Wanting him to be more on the ball about things that could go wrong for big things this time. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, um, it's weird thinking about me in a positive way, but I guess I, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you'd, you'd I mean, what, that's what I'm kind of really keen to know because you, you show up for James big, big times where he kind of makes uh, a mistake, but also kind of smaller things like with the bathroom. And I wonder what you, what is it you're trying to do for him? What is it you're trying to do? Um, st stop him messing up. Okay. He's got to stop messing up. And why? Why were you so concerned about him messing up? What? Why is that so bad for him? Um, just to, to be better. He has to be better. Be better. Yeah, and I, I get the sense. I mean, you could tell me if if you weren't there helping him, what would you fear would happen? Oh, that he'd just go, like, he'd get into all kinds of trouble, he'd be all over the place. Right. Yeah. 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 So you stop him from getting into trouble. What kind of trouble? What kind of trouble do you see him getting into if you weren't there? <laughs> Weirdly, it's quite actually that just getting into all kinds of problems. I had, like, a image of him just jaunting around and just not, yeah, just... Loads of mistakes, right. not not on it at all. Uh, a complete loss of 
structure, things like that. Okay. Is... So it sounds like you really show up to try and <clears throat> give him structure, but keeping on the ball to stop making mistakes. Do you try, do you ever tell him not to do things in case he makes a mistake or that's not really what you do? I'm more there to punish when he does something he should have known better. Right. And it sounds like you think he should know better about certain situations. Yeah, we should be more on it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a sense that if you weren't there, he could lose his structure and he he wouldn't, well, he wouldn't care about things or he'd just make too many mistakes or? Just like jauntling around, lots of things going wrong. Um, right. I jaunt like no purpose or? I, I don't know. I had a picture of him walking off, uh, oh. carefree and not really, not really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, why, are you, why are you so concerned about him being carefree? It sounds like they would bother you. Because the world isn't like that. That's, I right. guess is what's the deeper. Do so you like keep him that? realistic? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. And if it's okay to ask, critic, I, I won't kind of pry too much. But have you been in James's life for a while? Oh yeah, the whole time. Yeah. All the time. Can you remember when you first showed up? Pretty early on. Pretty early on. And, you know, this is the first time kind of meeting you, but I'd, if we could come back again and I was working with James, I'd, I'd love to know maybe where you where you showed up, with who you showed up. Because I get a sense that, you know, like for, for most people, critics got an important role. It's been there for a long time. It's tried to help in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Were you stronger in James's life at other earlier times? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's, I mean, just out of interest, what's allowed you to, because James was saying that, uh, like, credits, you've, you've settled down a little bit. I wonder what's, what's helped you to sort of relax a bit? Literally, it's CFT. <laughs> if yeah. it was, it literally started in 2018 in the imagery. Okay. That's where I just yeah. got turned off and I just. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay. So it sounds like what, what, what maybe has helped is, some therapy and training and things for James. What do you think that's given him? That's allowed you to kind of have a bit of peace and to rest a bit. Um, it gave, I think this is going to be the next chair. It gave a, an alternative view, a warmth, uh, an acceptance. Um, mm. And I think the more and more I did that with others and then I could see it change for others because I wanted others to do better. Yeah. The more I could recognize I needed that chair. And that chair yeah. became more and more powerful. Yeah. I think so that's what that chair is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when James could accept, um, could accept certain things, and he maybe got confidence in accepting things and seeing acceptance work for others, that that you didn't have to be so on the ball with everything. Yeah. That it was okay to <clears throat> be, be as as I am. So that that's what that chair was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just before we kind of um, before we kind of draw this to a close, I mean, what could I call you if we if we were, if I was speaking to you again? Is the critic the right name for you? Guardian. Guardian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> guardian. And it sounds like you know what would be your guardian message to James that when I bring him back, that you'd really want him to remember and hear. Is this is this from reflect from a from, from the place? guardian? Part. No, just from the from the guardian, the critic. Yeah. Oh. The core message here is always be on guard, but uh, yeah. and always always be ready. But it's very hard to be completely distinct from these two other parts. But that, that's, if I was at yeah. the core, that's what it's saying. Yeah. So to, to be on guard, be on guard. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And just if we were thinking, how much, um, if say the room that you're in is James's sort of, uh, I don't know, James's world. And mind, how much space do you take up, critic? In James's, oh, he's quite big. He's he's a big character. Uh, okay, he's a big guardian. Be, before it would have been like the whole room. Almost, they would have been like an air of it. Uh, whereas now he's just a big character. Okay, so you you as the guardian, you're a big character in the room. Yeah, just like like yeah. this. Yeah, that's <laughs> brilliant. So James, if I could speak to James back in the middle, that'd be great. <laughs> so thank you. Much respect to the critic. And, yeah. and uh, in in this kind of approach to chair work, you say, okay, so it's kind of just noticing that you're in the centre, 
you know, you're back as James there, and we just be aware that there is a part of you there that is a guard, a force, like a guardian. And it sounds like it, it's been there a long time. Um, it's got its histories maybe right back kind of early on in life, um, which we would love to explore and get to know. But it still shows up to keep you on the ball, to keep you watching out for errors, to give you structure so you don't go off and be carefree because that's not, it thinks it's not the real world. You need to focus and maybe achieve and kind of not not fail anyway. Um and it's kind of the thing you wanted to share with you is it is it's a kind of guardian, it's concerned about you um making errors and maybe being seen to make errors. So just kind of coming back to the middle and just yeah. knowing there's that kind of <clears throat> kind of energy there. Kind of but you're you're James back in the middle. Back in the middle. Um, am my back is it of you? Is there more is there more just to come? No, we could just stop there. That's fine. It's just to illustrate that particular exercise. Yeah. And this, and this and, chair would have been compassionate. Or... Well, I'd kind of ask you, like, how did it feel, like, to hear about that guardian there? And you know, there's there's loads of different chair work exercises you oh, can okay. do. So, I mean, that was still like an interview one. You could do it. Could have been a dialogue one where you dialogue with the compassionate self. But this one here is just to kind of get to know it. And in the middle is almost like a kind of an awareness of this stuff. It's like a aware ego, as it were, from voice dialogue. And you can kind of notice that there is a, a critic, but I wonder if, you know, there might be, particularly if we talked about the history of the critic, there might be a sad part too about, yeah. but actually it's it's quite hard to um, have someone on guard all the time. And actually, you know, I might ask to, could I speak to the, the carefree part, the part that actually, um, you know, wants to chill out. The critic's really concerned about James being carefree, but, you know, we could speak to that part and, see what it wants to do and where it's been for James kind of thing. So that's one way of working, using chair work to explore the function of the critic. And I, I don't know what it was like for you to to play the role of the critic and then step out of it. It was, uh, yeah, it was quite powerful. I, I, I never say I've got much imagery usually. You know, you know, you did on the imagery when you do zero to five. Yeah. I always thought I was kind of a one or a two, but when I was in that chair, the whole room, you know, you said, what was it like? It all kind of had like mm. a spiraling, like darkness that was like the mm. power of it. And the, the image was, was really quite powerful, um, which I wasn't expecting. And I was also wasn't expecting my ability to extract. Into it's weird, this. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I was the inner critic. I hundred percent was, uh, and I didn't think I could do that. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. And in psychodrama, they call those action insights. So from playing and embodying the role, <clears throat> you know, you're not just talking about this stuff anymore. You're kind of embodying it, and you get information from from how you feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, your your critic look quite light, and it, maybe it's because we're talking on film and things. But um, you know, imagine if we went back and explored <clears throat> the origins of the critic. It could be. You know, could be all sorts of things come up. And then the idea is you really embody it and then you separate from it. And it's then being aware um, that this is a part of you, a pull. It's going to show up. But we kind of know what its gift is in a way. It's trying to protect you. We don't have to go along with it, uh, what it says. And we don't have to lean into it. We can draw on other parts of us, like the compassionate self, for example. Um, but it's kind of helpful to know I, mean, I don't know if it is helpful to know that when your critic shows up, it's just trying to be a guardian for you, and it's concerned about your your safety, your performance, your being aware of mistakes that could be made. It's information. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's really interesting as well. The the the, the reinterpreting the inner critic. Um, and I think that's yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, uh, excellent. Well, I, I'm absolutely, yeah, that has opened my eyes loads. I'm really glad we did that. Uh, that's just shown really clearly what chair work is like. Um, I mean, the, I think just as a kind of caveat for, for folk, there's there's loads, loads of different chair work exercises, and there, there are different critics, really. So, you know, there are critics that have um, more of a sort of motivating, demanding kind of function, and Paul Gilbert's got a scale where he splits them into self-criticism and self-hatred. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other therapies separate them too, like the self-critic and the killer critic, um, the demanding parent, the punitive parent. Working with a critic like this is helpful if you, 
if if it's not too toxic. So, you know, if, if a critic was saying, like, James needs to die, for example, I wouldn't be going there and doing this kind of work. Um, if there's usually, like, high levels of hatred, high levels of disgust, then you might need to do a slightly different piece of work where it is often about recruiting, like, an angry pushback against this internalised voice. So um, it might be, um, like, putting a chair there and saying you know, who does this kind of remind you of? Where does this voice come from? Actually, this was a voice that was imported in from the outside world and it's kind of stuck in you. And it's kind of like a stone weighing on your belly. It's kind of, you can't metabolize it. We need to just throw it up and expel it because it came from the outside. Let's put it back out there. And in that kind of example, um, some therapies talk about coming in then and protecting the kind of vulnerable child, the the part that took in the voice at that age. So, you know, if you had a dad that was really critical and you were at seven, when you first heard that you were disgusting and whatever, then you would put dad on the chair and, you know, you'd step in and say, actually, we're not taking this message in. We're giving this back out to you. You didn't give James or Tobin what they needed, whoever we're working with, um, you know, what, what Tobin needed, he needed, um, like, kindness, care, support, you didn't give it. This is your problem. This is because you couldn't cope. We're putting that message back out there. And, you know, you can, you, you're can you really firm. And as a therapist, you often need to step in and model or help the person to push the voice out, um, like a kind of re-scripting in chair work, really. And then you care for the, the little one who took in the message and explained what's happened and, you know, how you see them through through your adult eyes or your compassionate self eyes and um, you know, kind of change, change what occurred, change the, the meaning that's extracted from what occurred back then. Um, so kind of, kind of compassionate imagery scripting within trauma. Is that kind of, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's just, if the, if the critic has come from an abusive other, do we want to integrate it? I mean, that's, that's the kind of question. All the, the, the chair work when we did there, it's, it's kind of about like getting to know the critic and maybe work like respecting what it's trying to do, but you know, maybe we can still make decisions and we understand it as part of the family as it were. Whereas if it's really abusive and actually it's an echo um, or just a kind of internalization of an abusive person, we don't really want to take that in. We want to maybe take in the part that's frightened and uh, you know, that, that let it in because what else could we do? And, you know, we played it out internally to avoid that internal external attack. Um, but we need to expel it. So it kind of chair works often is it either an integrating thing or we trying to expel kind of, kind of a voice. Um, it's not particularly healthy to try and expel lots of voices really, because they're part of us and they have a function, but doing something like that, where you push that message and voice back, um, is really powerful and often really needed. Um, cause otherwise it's just, it has free reign and it will just crush every therapeutic progress you get. Okay. So, so a bit of sense. a scale there of a yeah. critic that's kind of slightly having a go at us to a shaming, a kind of abusive voice that we need to push back. We yeah. Need to, we, we need to push back, at, especially in the trauma. From, from yeah. Our... And we need to sort of recruit healthy defenses f- for, with, the client so we need to help them attack uh, uh not attack to, to show assertive anger compassionate anger to protect um out and we need to help them to be able to extricate themselves from it so rather than sort of collapsing freezing submitting under the weight of that that powerful other voice we we learn to compassionately hold boundaries for them that's my understanding of it anyway yeah, that's absolutely yeah, yeah excellent to kind of kind of understand and reflect on and and yeah completely opening my eyes here i i guess I, I feel like i was getting into cft and then i've seen like the 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 broader picture which is excellent and and a lot for me to reflect on as a practitioner myself um yeah. i would love to uh, I, i'll definitely be signing up for your um chair work um kind of workshops um and uh, I, I guess just just so that my kind of viewers can see a little bit um, from from what they can, if they want to find out more, um, yeah. you've got kind of you've got a web page, haven't you? On uh, and yeah. you do you do workshops on chair work? Do you want to say just a little yeah. bit about that? 
<clears throat> yeah, so with a colleague, um, Matthew Pugh, um, we run Chairwork. So if you type Chairwork into Google, it'll come up there. And what, we, what we're interested in is is different ways you can use sort of chairs and dialogical ways of working with distress. And we try to make it just helpful for people. So there's loads of resources there. There's loads of guides. The research that Matthew and I do um, is up there free to have. So it's quite good to see some of these processes and to explore some of the research and ideas behind it, like um, the idea of embodiment, like the we saw a bit of it today, but the power of moving over and being a part as opposed to talking. We could have talked about self-criticism, and but when you go over and be it for a little while and then you step away from it, so there's a sense of you know immersion, but then separation. So, you know, there's all sorts of really interesting kind of factors going on um, that that are kind of really worthy of exploration, I think, and understanding, and they really help. Things like, for example, um, externalization. So when you externalize a part of yourself, um, be it part in distress, it kind of helps the self-compassion process because it's like you can recruit your skills that you might use for other people. Suddenly you can recruit them for your inner world because now it's out in another chair and it's so much easier to give compassion to yourself and externalize form than it is just to give to like, I don't know what you look down and give it to your toes type thing. So like to give it there, you can picture a face, you can imagine that it's an exchange, you can swap over and then receive it, all that kind of stuff. So you know, we've, we try to explore the research, all this, you know, all these kind of factors and they're interesting. I think even if you don't pursue chair work, they're interesting uh, therapeutically, I think. So yeah, we do training. Um, there's training via the Compassionate Mind Foundation as well. Um, but yeah, so we do train like a three day kind of uh, covering the basics, but we do one for eating disorders as well and um, for IAPT and you know, all sorts. So, well, yeah. Um, if anyone wants to kind of follow this, I'll put the link in below. Um, and, and yeah, I'll definitely be uh, booking on to one of the uh, workshops. Um, really has uh, been eye opening. So I really, I really appreciate you coming on today. No, um, no problem. And uh, like I said, yeah, big dream of mine is to talk with the lecturers who have kind of influenced me over over my over my life um, and my career. So I really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. Oh, cool. Lovely to speak to you, James. Okay. All right. um, well, see, see you soon. Thanks.